We will start by introducing Xavi. Xavi? Yes. We've known each other for many years, and we met for the first time at a conference on footprints of the war, at a time when no one was talking about this. I think we were just a bunch of nerds, and a publication came out of that that is still quite relevant. And ever since then, we've met on and off, and we've never lost respect for one another. And I would like to say that Xavi was my boss, he's been one of the best bosses I've ever had, but I've always criticized that his time was very short in office. I think the town council of Barcelona lost a huge potential when Xavi left uh, town council. I, I was really upset, and he knows that, because when I knew he was to be my boss, it was like, whoa, I won the lottery. And then this excitement lasted uh, too short a time. And the day Karma called me and said, let's meet, uh, I need to talk to you, I said, well, with you, anything. And Anna, I met her on that day when Chabi said, we need to talk. And I fell in love with her from the very beginning too. Oh, I'm sorry. I have not said any of the official things I had to say. Xavi is professor at the Autonomous University of Barcelona, PhD in contemporary history, and his research interest is the civil war, uh, social movements, generally speaking, and the transition and these changes that link together politics and economy. He has published so many papers and books and he also participates in talks in, in, on the radio, like one. And Anna is a journalist, a photographer. And as I said, I fell in love with her from the moment I met her. And she presents with such passion that you cannot say no. And I said, well, use me for wherever you need. And here we are, Anna, her profession, being a photographer, has meant that she's worked in the cultural sphere and she worked with Xavi in Barcelona Sota las Bombas, Barcelona Under the Bombs, which was a great exhibition that I hope you remember. And she's worked mainly on culture. She's also worked with great artists in the country, such as Pera Jaula, and she also works with the Catalan Cinema Academy and the Malaga Civil, Civil Cinema Festival. Sorry, I said Malaga instead. And Anna and Xavier, I think, make up a perfect team. Anna is the artistic side of things. She brings her camera lens, and Xavier brings his expertise and, and content. But I always say, that a team is what triumphs, and this project could have not been carried out with just one or the other. And well, you can start because I think it will be a wonderful presentation that will make us fall in love with the project and will make us all want to come to the opening of the exhibit here on the 30th at the former prison, La Mudel. So you have the floor. It is an honor to have you introduce us, and I will first apologize to you publicly. I've done it in private several times, and now I'll do it uh, publicly because I was uh, my my time in that memory commission was so brief. I was unable to meet expectations at that time, which was turmoil for me. And, well, it is an honor for us to have you introducing us because your work, the work that you've been leading for many years in the field of memorial archaeology and shelters has been a source of inspiration. You will see it in the exhibit, so I will not develop that now. But I wanted to thank you 
not only for the introduction, but for everything you've done over the years. And why this talk? Basically, what we will try to do is to tell you about the memorial significance of an exhibition that should already be open, and so it would have been obvious um, in this today's here together. But since it isn't quite finished yet, it will open in a couple of days. days so we would like to have you free up your afternoon to come here with us on the 30th. And I would like to tell you about the context of this exhibit of 1,322 shelters. That is the current census. And it has to do with a subjective perspective. It is a subjective perspective on Anna's pictures to valorize heritage in artistic terms. Despite all of the work done, this heritage is still quite occult. It is still quite cover up, covered up and not present in society. And the idea of this exhibition is to work on overcoming the problems that democratic memory has had in our country, in Barcelona, in Catalonia, in Spain building memory around shelters is absolutely necessary. And it is absolutely necessary because remembering shelters helps us overcome many of the difficulties in remembering the war, the experience of the bombings, and a democratic memory that will allow us to get to know ourselves better as citizens, as country, and to be stronger when facing our present and our future. And the memory of the bombings and the memory of the shelters oftentimes is dealt with separately, and I think this is one of the weaknesses. For a long time, I would say it was not only forgotten, but disavowed for obvious and not so obvious reasons. The obvious reason is that when you build anti-fascist memory after the Second World War, or when you build European democratic memories, well, we here were in the long black night of the Franco regime. This country resisted the fascist, the initial fascist efforts, but we suffered for 40 years of dictatorship. That's the most obvious thing. But there's something else to that, and this is why I think this memory of the bombings and the shelters is important. And this is the construction, on the one hand, of these European anti-fascist memory with a series of topics that made it strong back in the day but weak later on. And here, and I could talk about this for a longer time, about uh, Austrian and French memory, but, and well, bombings and directly related to Italian fascists, so I will talk about Italian memory. In order to try and build a consensus in a very divided society, in Italian society, they built this memory based on two big topics. Il bravo italiano and el cattivo tedesco. Italians understood essentially as brave and good people, and the Germans understood as the evil uh, Germans the evil Germanic peoples. The process of resistance and liberation in Italy conceptualized, is conceptualized in Italy as a national liberation war. Liberation against whom? The Germans. Yes, but fascism had its own entity in Italy with Mussolini. Mussolini, well, it seems he was Italian. So this construction that of memory that tries to minimize, and, and it's partially accepted by anti-fascists. It tries to minimize the very harsh character of Italian fascism, 
And it has two perspectives that have to disavow each other. One is the war in Ethiopia, because here you cannot build an image of the brava gente of Italy there. And the other one is the Spanish Civil War, the Spanish Civil War for two reasons. The participation of fascist Italy is essential, at least in two senses. One, that at the beginning of the war, Franco was not defeated. This would lead us into a historic reflection that I cannot make here. But all the troops from Morocco were taken to Andalusia, thanks to the Italians. And here, for the first time in Europe, Saturation bombing was practiced, but saturation bombing on the civil population where the civil population was the main target and not collateral. So it's, it's no accident. It is a necessary development of the war techniques for the Second World War. This is one of the reasons. And another reason is that the Spanish Civil War was an Italian war. There were Italians fighting on the side of the Republicans and Italians fighting on the side of Franco. So these myths were taken aside by Italian memory. This shared experience, shared to the extent, and I will not develop this anymore, but Italian anti-fascists were trained in the Spanish Civil War. They fought in the Spanish Civil War. And these disappeared. This did not become part of official history. And on the other hand, the Franco regime after the Second World War had no interest in any memory or any history. Actually, they will negate any history that can link them to the Nazi Germany and fascist Italy. There's this, this narrative saying that Franco fought for Spain not to enter the Second World War, and it was the other way around. It was Hitler who did not let him. And anti-fascist European memories are weak, and this can be clearly seen during the revisionism of the 80s and during the 90s. Once you negate, you deny that there was a civil war in Italy, from what revisionists say, it was a civil war. It was and once you have denied the harshest character of fascism, they end up saying it was a civil war between two models of the, the motherland, two models of Italy, where they were both culprits and, and victims. It's similar to the narrative of the Spanish Civil War, and it makes us weak because this memory is not connected to the experience of European fascism. Still, and I think it's obvious, and, and we heard the chronology earlier, ever since the change of millennia, there's been a whole movement of memorials, activists for memory, and a recovery of the memory, m more in the Catalan case, but in the Spanish case, this did not come with democracy. It came with activists in the 90s and the 2000s. Democracy initially, what it did was, let's not talk about these things, let's look at the future, let's overcome the past, because if we look at the past, it seems like we're doing it over and over again. This memory is oftentimes built looking for the least amount of conflict. And this is something that Jordi Kishé said. When this memory movement started, he said shelters and bombings was the most interesting thing for, God, for, for town councils for an obvious reason first. This is what impacted the most people in a collective experience. So there is a memory, a permanent memory in society, but also because, and this is why you talked about the need to remember shelters, it can easily be turn, turned into a narrative of, of the victims in which you only acknowledge the pain of the victims and you do not go beyond that. And I will try to symbolize this with memory spaces, uh, bombings, and shelters, and then I'll pass it over to Anna. It is obvious 
that Franco regime manipulated and negated uh, historic memory. And the memory sites of the city of Barcelona stay despite this denial. A memory site is a site in which you remember a historic situation that took place there and it evokes and condensates a series of events and experiences that go beyond that site. There are memory sites that are created by political decision such as El Valle de los Caídos, the Valley of the Fallen, which is the main fascist death monument in the world. And I think it's very difficult to resignify it. With memorial laws, laws they've tried to resignify it. And I believe in memory policies and defending memory sites, but in some cases, I remember that sentence that said, Oblivion is beautiful, forgetting is beautiful. So some places are difficult to resignify. But sometimes the sites are so powerful that you need to manipulate them rather than deny them. Here in the back you see San Felipe Neri Square. This is a memory site in and of itself for several reasons. It suffered the bombing of January 1938 and the first saturation bombing. So it was an early show of Italian war techniques, an indiscriminate bombing against the civil population, but also once the first wave of bombings ended, then a second wave came, which acted on those who had been spared or only injured during the first bombings. So it's not only that you will die. You are in my hands. You are in the hands of the attacker. I have a capacity to decide on your life and death and your capacity to save the injured. And this is the way they, they, they planned it. When you look at what Mussolini said about these bombings, that's what they said. The show of power of fascism, not very Bravo Italiano, right? Not uh, what we see in Captain Corelli's mandolin. And this new saturation technique that that happened for the first time in Barcelona started with the death of 40 children. So it's difficult to imagine a bigger symbol for this new war technique. It killed innocence and it generated poetry and mandates. People said this has to be remembered. Like this poet's poetry that said, uh, say it to everyone, say it here and there, children have died. But no one was able to say it because then the Franco regime came and we don't know exactly why this wall was maintained like this. They fixed up the walls but they kept the shrapnel of the bombs in the walls and there's a hypothesis. I would like to give you a hypothesis. The Franco regime tried to deny the bombings, and when they were not able to deny them, they manipulated them. In what sense? What they explain about this square, which became popular wisdom, so it's a manipulated manipulation that stuck. They said this was not shrapnel from the bombs. These were uh, bullet marks from the Reds shooting priests. That was not the case. These are marks from the bombs. But they explained it like that, and that stuck so much. And I have not checked it now, but in 2008, I remember a tourist guide that said, a tourist guide for tourists coming from Barcelona saying, during the Civil War, there were shootings here in Plaza de San Felipe Neri. And in one of the walls, there are still impacts from the bullets. No, there were no shootings here. There were children who died due to a fascist attack. It became memorialized. There's a plaque. And they decided, this is shrapnel in San Felipe Neri. And this is the monument in Gran Vía. And why did they decide to build it in Gran Vía? And there was an interesting question before. I think a bit mischievous, but he, the, a speaker asked, does anyone know what this is? Because people walk by, and they know this is something blocking their way. 
it generates problems, but it is a monument that opened in 2003, and the aim is to commemorate, to symbolize the bombings of 16th, 17th, and 18th March 1938, where that experience that had been lived in San Felipe Neri at 11 a.m. in a sunny Sunday morning, ended up with three days of constant bombings in Barcelona, this impact of this new war technique. The United States ambassador uh, claimed against it, the Vatican as well. The Vatican said, we know that Franco is a noble person of deep Christian beliefs, so we believe he will not uh, let this continue to happen. It was like a big... Uh, everyone says that they, they claimed against it, but they were actually praising Franco when that happened. So what happened with what happens with that monument? The way I see it, the monument is all right. I will not get into that. But I think it still reproduces some problems of a memory that is too focused on the narrative of the victims decontextualized of the reasons for the attack. Jordi Guichet, I don't know if it was today or yesterday, but he built this melancholy memory of the first decade of the millennium. A memorial combat at that time was very strong, and I'm his same age, and I think that we, when we get older, we build this epic of our youth, and things were not so strong back then, and they are not as weak as we make them seem now. And, well, I don't know why, but I had to go through all of the files of the Democratic Memorial about the monuments of the town councils and the Catalan government facing the reality that it that Republican memory was doubly clandestine during the Franco regime and afterwards during a democracy that did not acknowledge it. And here in Barcelona this happened less, but in the rest of Spain they still maintained Franco symbols. In Still in the democracy we maintained symbols of Franco regime. So they opened a pool of funds to create monuments to commemorate the victims of the rep Republic because no one is doing so. And I had to go through the, the files and it was quite interesting. I was shocked because there were many town councils in Catalonia that starting uh, started by proposing a monument to remember the victims of the Republic. But three or four months later, the name changed in the file and it became a monument to remember all of the victims of the war. Okay, yeah, that's fine. But the f f line of financing was not for that. It was for the Republican side. And then, in the end, it became a monument for peace, which is fine, but something happened along the way. And the town council said, oh, whoa, whoa, look out. Okay, let's say peace, because we all agree to peace. Yes, well, but uh, Franco also celebrated 25 years of peace with his regime. Yeah, but things have happened here, and we have to, to tell people about them. And in this sense, the memory of the bombings, which is because of its impact, well, when you drop a bomb, a Republican or a fascist may die. Uh, bombs, no, no sites. Agustí Santellas said about the bombings in Lleida that there's a picture of a woman with her husband on the floor. And I think these were bombings of the Condor Legion. And the person on the floor was a person in favor of Franco, and he died due to a bomb dropped by Franco's allies. So this is a memory that allows to build these symmetric memories and not get into too much conflict. Uh, we talk about the victims. And the monument has this plaque to people dead in fascist bombings. And here it is easy to say fascist because they are Italian fascists. Yeah, they were fascists. That's it. But then Francoists, are they fascists or not? We don't get into that. It makes it easier to say. 
uh, during the civil war, uh, uh, during the civil war in Barcelona, and all people's victims of other wars. It's okay. It's fine. I will not get into whether it's good or not, but I believe that it does not respond to the need for contextualization to why these bombings happened, what society were they part of, these victims, and what did they do? Because the problem with the memory of the victims, and I'll finish very briefly, sorry. This type of memory is good when, at the time of acknowledging the pain. That is good, but when you make the subject into a pure object of pain, you are condemning them twice because of the death and because you're not acknowledging who that person was beyond that pain. Memorial uh, policies and the declaration of the Lyceum, they said, we were the victims of Francoism and so the fighters for freedom. So this is linking the repression with the resistance and the fight for freedom. One thing cannot be without the other. What you will see now, and thanks to, I would like to thank the Carcoresa for sending me the video. This was the original monument that was planned in Gran Via. Not the one I showed in the picture, but this one, which was the work of Francesca Bat. And actually, the committee that had to decide decided on this one, not the one that was finally installed, but this one. The reasons for not using this one and using the other one, I think, well, maybe if Ricardo Conesa wants to tell us about it, he will. But why a committee makes a commission and decides on one thing and then another thing happens? Well, we, one would need to see what happened there. But this monument by Francesca Bat was a monument devoted to the victims of the bombings that evocated um, a shelter that made us, that looked like a shelter, linking the memory of the, the bombings with the, the memory, the remembrance of the shelters. And this expression of total war warfare linked to the resistance to that total warfare. And bombings, yes, there are memory sites from bombings, but shelters are not a thing of the past, they are a thing of the present. We walk over them on a daily basis. And contrary to public memory sites, such as San Felipe Neri, we cannot access shelters. Oftentimes, citizens do not know these shelters in all of their dimensions. And actually, the fact that we can now access shelters is thanks to an active decision of citizens, activists, memorialists, neighbors' associations, a proactive fight, a proactive struggle to open up these shelters and town councils opening them up. It was an active decision. And shelter, shelters speak of, and I will, I, now I will finish, they say that victims were not victims per chance. It's not that it's not per chance. The case of Barcelona is very obvious. When you look at Mussolini's uh, speeches, Mussolini made this brutal speech. He was absolutely proud. They said we would not pass, and we did. We massacred them. And it is a source of pride for Italian fascists to have massacred Barcelona. And it is because Barcelona had become one of the big symbols of anti-fascism on July 18, 1936. Barcelona is one of the first places where the coup was stopped. And beyond the experience of the citizens, well, it happened because of the experience of the citizens, but fascists counted all of their battles as victories in Italy, in Germany, in Austria, wherever they had fought, they had won. And the first time they were stopped, or one of the first few places where they were stopped was here in Barcelona. And this turned Barcelona into a symbol of anti-fascism, and they had to obliterate it. Mussolini signed telegrams asking for the bombings. Barcelona was one of the first cities of the Republican rear guard, and this is why it was attacked massively. 
However, in order to understand that society, because yes, everyone was a victim of the bombings, but the model of building shelters is different based on the values of the society. The model of Barcelona was a collective building model where citizens basically decided to save the lives of their fellow citizens. The citizens decided to make this huge uh, collective construction work with their own hands and by their own means. And the memory of bombings is inseparably from the, inseparable from the memory of shelters. And, and now I will finish. Just a couple more things. One last reflection, and I'll finish. This exhibition, when you are able to see it, it will open on the 30th. It has a different meaning as well. With Anna, we've talked about this a lot. I participated. I was commissioner of the 2007 exhibit, and in 2008, when the underground is a shelter, I think these were the two exhibits, yes. And back in the day, those exhibits had a huge impact. But I would say that every new present changes the past as well. The present is a product of our past, and we cannot understand the present without a past. But whatever we observe in the past, in each new present, whatever we evoke, memorially changes with the circumstances of our present. It's a, a dialogue. And in this sense, I think that the exhibit that we've created, contrary to the one in 2007-2008, takes place after the big financial crisis, after the big crisis of the world pandemic, and at a time in which there is a war again in Europe. And in this sense, the fact that we are going down to the shelters again and our, our perspective of the shelters goes beyond our need to strengthen democratic memory. It changes and it shows us how we oftentimes walk on a city we do not know over a past that is under our feet but is hidden. And this is why we're recovering shelters in a past that shows us that our present is fragile. That whatever we consider absolutely normal can change overnight. Overnight, citizens had to start building shelters to save their lives. And I think this is something we want to do in the exhibition as well. Fighting for normality is a, is a struggle as well. It's not just accepting what is. It is a struggle in which shelters continue to be a symbol of the resistance in Barcelona. And that's all. Thank you very much. Good afternoon or good evening. <laughs> if you know me, you know that today it's a very important moment because it's the first time that I'm going to share publicly a work that I have been doing for years. And I'm doing this with two people that have had a powerful influence in my life, particularly in the way of understanding history and memory. And I'm going to start with Karma Miró. Karma Miró, um, I read a, a sentence, um, and it's a sentence she had said, the Barcelona shelters are the civil heritage and the most valuable heritage of people in Barcelona. I have been thinking a lot about this sentence and has given me strength in difficult moments. And it was one of the seeds of this project. Twenty years ago, I met Xavier, Xavi, when he was teaching a course in uh, Casa Elizalde. It was the civil war from the perspective of those who lost the war. And I think that was also another seed for this project that I'm going to 
share with you. And what I want to do is to share these pictures with you. And I'm going to try to move you as I'm moved when I think about the past. The, past. the first key point of this project was born or happened three years ago. I studied 400 shelters out of the 1,322 in Barcelona. And I went or visited 40 shelters. I didn't know when I started how many shelters I could access. I thought 50. Xavier thought about 30. We would manage to visit 30. In the end, 40. We were able to visit 40. We wanted, by the means of photography to show a heritage that has been hidden, that the vast majority of uh, citizens don't know. Um, we walk in a city that is full of holes. And when we say 1,322 shelters in Barcelona, everyone is surprised. So we want all this accumulation of images, images to, uh, to show the power of this uh, network of shelters. The pictures are not black and white pictures. I haven't transformed the spaces. We haven't turned these spaces into ideal spaces. We have worked a little bit with the light to bring light underground. Uh, it's a light that remembers the incandescent temperature, a warm light that floods these spaces. And uh, sometimes we have had some problems printing uh, or conveying this light. But we really want to convey the past through these uh, pictures. I'm going to show first some accesses to shelters, because we like these doors. These doors opened. Uh, this uh, shelter had a key. This is the entrance to the shelter of Casas factory. It's a picture we particularly like because we see the ground and the underground, the past and the present. It has the key hanging on the door. And it shows how historical spaces, the factory was very important, and now are part of uh, the everyday life. And the owners are not aware of the heritage they have here. Another door. This is the access, and it's a staircase that Xavi likes particularly. This is the access to the passive defense shelter of <laughs> Catalonia. We thought that this shelter had been destroyed because in 59, the building in Passage de Gracia 116, where the offices of the passive uh, defense uh, offices were, and um, here we should mention Ramon Pereira, but I'm not going to go into detail. Pereira himself built a shelter to protect the alarm system, the anti-aircraft system. He created a shelter, quite an exceptional shelter. It was uh, big. There are only two chambers and the left, and this is one of the entry points. This is the second staircase going down. And now I'm going to show you the access to a private shelter. Um, private shelters are in uh, houses. And these people have opened up the doors uh, to their homes to visit the shelters. That uh, shows that people trusted in us and wanted to show these spaces that for many years have been hidden. And they are still um, household places or private places. The resistance memory, you know what memory places are, so I'm not going to dwell on it. But 1,322, we wanted to create a map of uh, memories of um, places of memory of the resistance. For me, it's special because visiting 
these places. It's It's been a transformative experience for me as a photographer, and I'm going to show you an image. That's the in shelter of the Passive Defense Board. I have chosen four shelters. It's part of one of the parts of the exhibition. This is the command room for the protection of the whole Catalan population. If there was an air attack, a chemical attack, or a marine attack, it was connected with the army in the east, and it had this uh, command room here. You can see this tunnel, and you'll see many pictures like this one in the exhibition. It seems an exit, an escape tunnel, but it was the shelter of a military school, which was uh, located under the um, <coughs> Pia School, and I was there the other day, and I was talking to some teachers, current teachers, and they didn't know about the shelter. And I found out about the shelter because my daughter was playing at, uh, basketball at that school, and I was reading, and I read about the shelter, and a person from the school showed me the shelter. At that moment in Catalonia, a war industry was expanding or was being created. There were the war industry commissions, uh, and weapons were built to feed the Republican side. And here you can see the shelter of factory number 14, which is under the uh, Salesian School now. It's flooded, and it seems to me uh, fantastic, a fantastic place. We found a, a comb that was completely destroyed that we didn't touch. This is the shelter under the um, Generalitat Palace. This shelter was renovated thanks to Jose Maria Contel, who had the documents of this shelter until 2016 uh, was not reopened. We went there, we took pictures. In this four, with these four spaces, I think you can have an idea of what it means, um, this idea to build uh, the, the memory of resistance. Um, you have an example of a weapons arms, an institutional shelter, um, the command room. The idea here was to maintain this political life underground when the bombs were falling. I'm going to show this image to, I don't know where Lourdes is. Lourdes has uh, edited the pictures, and without her, it wouldn't have been possible. This is the seed. This is the image I had in my head when I started the project. I was walking in Barcelona. I knew about the projects. I'm not Catalan. I come from Sevilla. And for me, it was something marvelous, this uh, heritage. And I couldn't understand that uh, Catalan people um, had not uh, registered all this uh, legacy and uh, didn't give value. So I started to make these compositions of images underground and street level. Here you can see this uh, shelter. We have, this is in Passaggio Simo, you can see Sagrada Familia at the background. It is a weird image. It's not a comfortable one. And here I, you can see a subsoil and a street level. This is Plaza Tetuan. This is Toledo Street. This is the shelter in Toledo Street. It is a concrete hall, and this is the poster for the exhibition. 
This is Juan de Green Shelter, and what you see above is a building that replaced the building um, which belonged to Rubiralta family. And this fantastic building was demolished, and a new building was built. And under the building, you can find the Juan de Green Shelter. And I would like to talk about light. I've been talking for two years with some of you about light, and you might be tired um, about that. I've tried to bring light to the underground, but finding the right light, it's been a challenge. It is a baroque light to generate volume. It's a hard light, too. And it's not always a comfortable light, but for me, light was essential. I want to share a couple of images where light is very important. This is the access point to La Lira shelter in San Andreu neighborhood. It can be visited. The association in San Andreu shows the... And, um, the shelter and people can make a, a voluntary contribution. They they asked me when I went there for two euros, but I spent hours there, so I gave them 20 euros. And here, Juan de Green Shelter, here you can see the light, this uh, Baroque light you can see in here. And I'll go very quickly. Um, we'll talk about the five parts of the exhibitions. Uh, the five parts of the exhibitions, 18 shelters. This is the collective shelter, the Barcelona model, Ramon Pereira, when he went to London. He left Barcelona and went to London, and he explained the passive defense model of Barcelona. The model was called the Barcelona model. It was a collective a shelter underground. This might seem obvious now, but at that time, um, when the passive dis defense debate was very intense, and Pereira contributed with the Catalan experience. But didn't, that didn't um, become a, a network in the UK or in London. Here you can see an example. V372 that indicates that the family that lives in uh, Valencia Street 372 will sit here in that place. That helps to find people underground and indicates where the families could sit. The second part of the exhibition is, the pri is devoted to private shelters. This is an access uh, to the private shelter in Diagonal. Many pictures are from for our accesses. The former uh, beer factory dam in Rosalio Street has an incredible shelter underground, big one, large one, uh, with at different levels. I'm sharing here uh, images from the same shelter. And the fourth part or section, the third section of the exhibition. Sorry, uh, um, it, it, the third one would be the factories. And the fourth would be institutional life. It was the shelter under the former consulate of the Soviet Union in Barcelona. It's spectacular. Some people have visited it. It, you'll find many images of the ex in the exhibition. And the last section is uh, a little bit risky. We have three spaces like that, spaces used as shelters. Not all shelters are built as shelters. Uh, there were spaces, particularly at the beginning of the war, uh, underground subway stations, but other uh, spaces that were used as shelters. This is under the post office. We went there early in the morning, and 
These are the images we took. So I've shared the five sections of the exhibition, and I try to connect with an idea that Xavi mentioned, which is the attempt to um, photograph um, heritage right now in present time. And this is one of the lines of the research and the project. I'm going to show three spaces that connect horizontally and vertically, uh, underground and above ground, past and present. Here, this is the Passaggio Simo shelter with the concrete. It, rem it, it takes us back to the uh, desarrollismo time in the city and the building and building that finally has an impact underground. Underground and above ground, past and present, you see the Catalan vault that uh, combines this with the uh, modern image of concrete. Bookstore, La Inexplicable, Sun's Neighborhood is a fantastic uh, space. I recommend going there because they have fantastic books. Uh, um, we, in fact, we're going to launch the book uh, there. And it talks about the new uses of uh, resources. This bookstore has used the collective shelter. This is the access. They make book presentations, book launches in the shelter. They have underground. And finally, here a picture of Rai Campeguer of some roots. And this is, there are many roots in the shelters. This is the picture of a parking lot that gives access to the shelter in Revolution Square. Is another picture that uh, links past and present. And I'm going to show pictures of what was live under the bombs is another goal of this project um, by means of showing objects that tell us how was life in the shelters, that uh, mirror in uh, Tetuan Square shelter. Here, some cans. We'll find also objects that we found in uh, archaeological sites and that will be shown for the first time. Here, a soup pot that was partially melted, uh, pails for the building of uh, shelters. Um, there are many objects that were used to build the shelter, bricks from the 307 shelter and electrical equipment that was essential, light bulbs. Here you can see a depuration liquid that was very popular at the time. We found it at Bernat Mech shelter. And this is the image of the um, poster for uh, the exhibition that will open uh, in May. You will be able to see the exhibition here in La Model former prison till July. Thank you very much. <laughs>